All right, all right. So you guys have seen uh, some of you get the notes. How many of you pick up the notes, by the way? Just, just okay, pretty good, pretty good bit of you. I just, <clears throat> I started doing this. Uh, so, oh gosh, what? When we first started, Bev, uh, ten years ago, eleven years ago, started putting, doing the notes. Um, and I've, you know, I thought about stopping uh, several times, <laughs> several, several times, and and when, and and then you know I would get a response. I know, Pastor. So uh, anyway, I, I, I don't know if they're helpful to you. I, I believe they should be. Uh, basically what they are, and, and I'll just mention this to you, but basically what they are is uh, if I was listening to, to this word, uh, those notes are what uh, I would probably write down on, on my note page. That, that's what they are. They're, they don't always uh, make complete stories and so forth, but they, I think they carry the facts or the information that would help you to be able to look back at this at some point and say, um, man, I remember what this was about. Yeah, this one spoke to me. And if the Lord speaks to you, certainly you know, jot it down in the margin or write what he says to you because that's what really messages are all about. Thank you, Isaac. Appreciate that. You know, that's what messages are. They're they're intended to speak to your heart, you know. They're, they're intended for the Lord to use to, to say something dynamic to you or something simple to you. You know, a lot of times the most simple things are the most dynamic things. And God can change us in the twinkling. I mean, just the fraction of a, of a millisecond. God can do more in us than we could do in all of our lives, trying to learn and plan and scheme. I, the Lord speaks to your heart. It's just like a, you know, a jet right to your heart. It's just... Amazing. I'm going to read a passage to you, and uh, you see today is uh, being all right in an uptight world. I don't know if any of you are feeling uptight about this time of the year. Uh, there may be some reasons why you're uptight. You know, it may be your job, or it might be your family, or it might be just life in general. Uh, the life has a way of piling in on you, doesn't it? I mean, it just uh, really gets to you, and and we end up being a very uptight generation of people. But, of course, I've kind of felt like my generation. I was talking with a couple of other baby boomers yesterday. If you, I know some of you might have been confused. You might have thought that I was a millennial or, you know, but I'm... Um, I'm, I'm a couple of generations back from the millennial. You know, I'm, I'm past the Xers, and then I'm, I'm in that, that big one right in the middle uh, that's about 19 years wide called the baby boomers. Uh, those people born between 1946 and 1964. If you were born between 46 and 64, welcome, boomer brother. You are the boomer. Yeah, yeah. 70, 76, almost 77 million of us. Practically in 1964, one third of the population of this country were baby boomers, all born within 19 years of each other. We've changed everything, hadn't we? I mean, as we've come all the way up through, I mean, you guys, and, and would you allow me to brag just a second on, you know, what, being a boomer here a second? Because by far the vast, the, 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 by, by far the majority of people in our church are boomers. Uh, the majority of people almost anywhere are boomers because one third of the population of the country at the time were all within that population, you know? So as we moved up through, we just changed everything. Man, there was no rock music until we came along. Rock music, you know, I mean, of course, the rock music we played back then, they play in elevators now, so, I mean, there you go. You know? <laughs> I get in the elevator, and I say, man, that was hard rock back in my day, you know? <laughs> Simon and Garfunkel, Sound of Silent, Mama and the Papa, California Dreaming. I mean, you know, you just, you, you just hear these things. And then when we, uh, when we started having babies, you know, baby childbirth came along and so forth, uh, phew, man, they wouldn't let you go in a hospital room back then. They'd make you, they, you'd have to, dad, you, could, you couldn't even get on the same floor probably that your child was being born on. Now we just walk right in, put our mask on, breathe, you know. <laughs> that all happened because of us. Yeah, and then we started getting a little older, like in our 20s, late 20s, so forth. We started getting a little fat, and baby boom bulge came in, and fitness centers became the craze of this crazy nation that we're in, and they still exist. And that didn't happen until we came along. Yeah, and now that we're getting older, by the way, the youngest ones are 55, and the oldest ones are about 72 right now, so that gives you an idea of where we are. And now nursing homes and retirement villages and... And pharmacies, because we got to have our drugs, man. I'm serious. Boy, we we getting old, and we're going to get those drugs. Man. I mean, buddy, we gonna, we're not going to suffer unless we have to. And, 
And uh, we grew up, man, we were a generation of over-expectors, you know, if that's a good word to use. Uh, I, I, I saw when Crystal was singing the words in the song, you know, and it said expectation, you know, lies. And what, what they were expecting when the, when the shepherds went to the manger and, and when everybody saw the child Jesus, what they, they were expecting certain things, and, and they didn't see what they were expecting to see. Well, we baby boomers and those that have followed us now, our children and our grandchildren, we're all uh, plagued by what I feel like would be over-expectation. Uh, let, me, let me set up a story for you before I read this passage just real quick and, and we look at what I believe the Lord's saying to us today. Uh, Israel was in bondage in Egypt, and God, it was for hundreds of years, and God heard their cries, heard their pleas. Moses was begging. He was on the backside of a desert, you know, tending sheep, running away from the, running away from the call of God on his life, actually. And he was about 80 years old, and a voice came out of a bush back there that was on fire and said, Moses, I want you to go down, and I want you to speak to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. And Moses and all this stuff, you know, he tried to resist, and he tried to get somebody to help him and blah, blah. But anyway, he goes down, and he speaks to Pharaoh. And after 10 grueling rounds, it's like a 10-round heavyweight fight between God and Pharaoh, and plague after plague after plague after plague, God finally wears him down, wears him out, and in the 10th plague, when, I, when, when, when Pharaoh's son dies, Pharaoh looks and says, get, just get him and get out of here. And Pharaoh, I mean, Moses rounds them up, gets them heading out of there, and the Bible says they go out with a high hand. In other words, they're going out of the city giving high five. Yeah, yeah. We're not, I mean, happy, jubilant, excited, all kinds of expectations about what was going to happen because the children of Israel had been given a promise from God. He said, I'm going to take you to a land that flows with milk and honey. And in that land, you can have it all. Everything you need is in that land. It is the land that is made for you. And all you have to do is obey me and we'll, I'll walk you right into that land. And so Moses leaves Egypt and they walk and they come to the Red Sea and God says, touch it with your rod and the thing parts. They walk through on dry ground. Pharaoh has changed his mind and said, I got to get them back. What was I thinking? Oh my Lord, what? you know, we'll never make it around here without all those slaves. And, and he chases them. And then when he gets in the middle of the Red Sea, God closes it up on them and really made a way of no way back for Israel is what really happened there. You know, they're on the other side of the Red Sea. And as you will see, they're going to make some bad choices over there and they're going to think we can go back. There's only one problem. If we vote to go back, who's going to part the Red Sea for us again? Because God is not the God of a backward motion. I just want you to know that. And so they're carried out and, and they wander around for about two years. Now, as far as God's concerned, I really believe this. As far as God's concerned, Israel could have walked straight out of Egypt and walked straight into the promised land. It was only about a two and a half week journey. But here they are two years later, still wandering around out in the desert, and God brings them to a, a wide spot on the edge of, of Canaan, which is the promised land, a, a place called Kadesh Barnea. And he, and, he, and he says, all right, now, I, it's time to go in. You, you've, been, you've, been, you've been pussyfooting a ro a, 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 enough around here. Time to, get, time to go in. And so Moses says, all right, look. The people are a little concerned about this, and so I need to get me some spies, and I need to send them over into the land, and he chooses 12. Obviously, I believe, 12 of the greatest guys that he knows in the whole tribe of Israel. Two of them were Joshua. One was Joshua. One was Caleb. And then the others, you know, they were great guys of their tribes. And, and he says, all right, now go over into the land and, and bring us back a report and, and tell us about this land. He's hoping to encourage Israel. He's hoping to fire them up. He's hoping to get a report back that is going to encourage them to just walk right in, believe God, walk with God, go into the land and have it all. And of course, they go in and they bring, they come back out and, 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 and they have a, a sit down meeting. And Moses says, all right, uh, do you have a report? And uh, uh, the, the, the uh, one brother says, uh, uh, yeah, brother, brother moderator, uh, I, I do have a report. Um, 
I do have a report. Uh, this is the majority report. This is 10 of us uh, on this committee of 12 have agreed that um, God has not lied to us, that that is a wonderful land. That land does flow with milk and honey. God did not deceive us. He was truthful with us. And there are, man, he said, matter of fact, we brought this big bunch of bananas back, and it was on a pole, and big bunch of grapes back, and we brought them back just to show you just how great this land is. So God did not lie to us. However, there is one thing that God did not tell us. This land is occupied. This land has inhabitants that make us look like grasshoppers. There are giants in that land. <laughs> the sons of Anak and the big boys, and we look like a grasshopper in their side. And, and, and so, brother moderator, we make a motion, uh, as the majority committee report, we make a motion that we do not go into the land and that we stop right here. And as a matter of fact, I think we would like to go back to the land of Egypt. You know, I mean, it was safer back there. And, and there were many seconds, and there was much claim to receive the majority report from the committee. And then Joshua stood up, and he stilled the crowd. And he says, Brother Moderator, he said, the only thing I, Caleb and I have to say is, there are giants in that land. But if God is for us, who can stand against us? If God be for us, who could resist us? And we vote, brother moderator, that we go ahead and take the land. Yeah. And the people bowed their head, and the people turned their backs, and the people said, uh, mm, let's stay right here. And here's a part of the story that gets forgotten. Conveniently. When they take that vote, and they say, let's go back, and we're going to dump Moses as a leader because, after all, he's not much of a leader leading us out here for two years. We're not even in the land. He leads us to a land where the giants are going to kill us. So I vote, we've, I vote we replace Moses as leader. How about everybody? Who's for that? And they have a whale of a time criticizing Moses. Moses' own brother and sister criticizing. Makes God hot. God is beside himself. And God says... Moses, get out of the way. Get out of the way. I'm through with this bunch, this rebellious bunch right here. He said, I'm fixing to turn them into crispy critters. Move. Get, on, get, on, get out of the way. Get out of the way. I, I'm going to smoke them, buddy. He said, I tell you what we're going to do. We gonna, I, I, I'm going to hit them so hard that they won't even know what happened to them. And I'll, and, 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 and I'll make you a whole nother people that will be obedient this time. And Moses looks at God. This is one of the strangest conversations in the world. Moses looks at God, and Moses says, well, God, you need to think about this. Hold your roll. Yeah, yeah, hold your roll. <laughs> you need to think about this. If, all right, everybody knows that you are the God of these people that have come out of Egypt. All the nations around here know that, and they fear the people because they know how powerful you are and how much you love these people. And if you destroy these people, everybody's going to know you did it. And then they're going to say, what kind of God destroys his own people? What kind of God makes a covenant with them and then destroys them? And you'll be known as a God who doesn't keep his covenant. God, please forgive them. Please don't destroy them. Moses, please. I mean, Mo look, Moses is at the top of the criticism list. They are dogging him about how sorry he is and neglectful he is, and he's not any kind of leader. And What kind of general would do this? And he begs for them before God, and God forgives them again. And then, and then, a few days later, they get to thinking about this thing. And they say, mm, you know, maybe we need to reconsider this. You know, that land over there flows with milk and honey. That is a land where we can indeed have it all. So on second thought, I think we might ought to go back over into the land and take it. Who's with me? Oh, much acclaim. 
And then they come to Moses, and they say, Moses, we have reconsidered our decision. We have made another choice, is basically what they've said to him. And here is what happens. Then Moses told these words to all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. <laughs> what Moses is about to say to them is not going to make them happy. And they rose up, the people rose up early in the morning, and they went up to the top of the mountain saying, here we are, and we will go to the place which the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. In other words, hey, we sinned when we said we wouldn't go in, so we've had a second thought about it, and we've come back, and we want to go into the land. And Moses said, now, why do you transgress the commandment of the Lord? For this will not succeed. Do not go up, lest you be defeated by your enemies, for the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword. Because you have turned away from the Lord, the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up to the mountaintop. I love the way the scripture phrases that. They, they presumed. They thought, well, we're special. We're, he wouldn't do it to us. After all, we are his promised children. God loves us. God made a covenant with us. God promised us some stuff. We are God's fair-haired boy. We can make stupid choices, and God will not even care. And they presumed to go up to the mountaintop. Now, nevertheless, neither the ark of the covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed from the camp. That ought to have told them something right there, right? When you're going out to fight and the ark's not with you and your leader's not with you, that ought to say, stop. You're making a mistake here. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in that mountain came down and attacked them and drove them back as far as Hormah. Just routed them. This is an example of a people who believe that they can have it all. Who says you can't have it all? <laughs> that seems to be the theme of our generation, right? And the generations that have followed us. That was a question put to us, and all of us older boomer kind of guys. You'll have to forgive me, young people. If you don't understand any of the, some of the things I say, just ask your parents when you get home. <laughs> but that was a question put to us as a generation back in the late 80s by... Michelob Beer Company. <laughs> the question, you know, you remember this, the commercial? It was this very successful looking person on TV and they were dressed nicely and they had this wonderful voice and they said all of these things and then, and then, and then they held up that and they says, who says you can't have it all? And that kind of sums up the, the, the thought of our generations and the generations that have followed us. Who who, who says you can't have it all? I mean, after all, you know, we have changed everything in this whole society. The, our whole country has changed to accommodate us. We have done things that people said could never be done. We have accomplished things that people said are way beyond anything that you can comprehend. All of the things that we enjoy or most of the things that we enjoy now had its beginning with our great generation. We are a wonderful people. We are a blessed people. We are a driven people. And who says we can't have it all? So why are we so uptight? We're, we're, we're so uptight because we're a generation of over-expectors. I mean, like Israel here in this passage of Scripture. Israel thought, hey, we're special. Israel thought God made a promise. Israel thought all we have to do is walk over into the land. We just, we just leave, we walk in there, God's going to protect us, and everything is going to be wonderful when we go into land. They only made one mistake. And that is they forgot that they had been disobedient to God. And they thought, in spite of that, God was going to bless them and protect them and go with them just as if they had never made a, a bad choice, a poor choice. They, here's what they did. They centered in on the honey part, the promise part, and they conveniently forgot the bees part 
or, or, or the responsibility part. And we read their story, and I guarantee you, you were thinking as we were reading the story, don't do it. <laughs> it's not going to turn out good. You were thinking when you read the story, why would they, those people are nuts. I mean, what Moses is standing there telling them, don't do this. God is not with you. You are thinking poorly, and yet they just continue right on as if everything's great because their expectations were no matter what we do, no matter how we live, no matter how, what we do with God, God is going to bless us in spite of ourselves. They were over expectors just like us. Now, when we read it in black and white, it's very easy to see, and we become very critical of those people by looking at them and saying, man, who in the world would have ever done that? What would make them think that they could just turn their back on God and, God, and there was not going to be any consequences of their turning their back on God? Why would they think like that? I've got a better question. Why do we think like that? Why do we believe that in our lives, you know, God has made promises and we can make any kind of choices that we want to make and, 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 and there will be no consequences of those choices. How did we get to be a, a, a generation of over-expectors? Well, there, there are several reasons, I'm sure, and many, many sociological and psychological reasons, which I'm not a sociologist or a, psycholog a psych psychologist. <laughs> a psychologist. But I could probably give you two or three. One is, uh, we live in an affluent nation. Our poorest people in this nation are richer than most of the people in this world. We have goods. We have means. I grew up in the 60s. I mean, I was a young child in the 60s. And man, the 60s in this country was something. There was, this, it, it, was, it was unreal to be an American in the 60s. World War II had ended. The great society, those that have sacrificed, to, they call the silent generation. They're just great, wonderful people that did the work and, 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 and went and fought and did amazing things and established industry and created jobs and great affluent country. And after World War II, they came back and it was great. And I mean, that's actually where the baby boom came from, you know, if that tells you anything. But boy, the country was full of national pride, unity. We had an enemy called the Ruskies, the Russians, and man, we, we, you know, we, we raced with them to space, and, they, and everybody was full of nationalistic joy and pride and encouragement, and we all were together. We're the, we're, we're the United States of America, and we're a great land, and that's the environment that we grew up in very affluent, commercialism and, and, and manufacturing and all of those things just took off and there was just tremendous economic activity going on everywhere. Money was flowing, life was flowing. I mean, there were subdivisions and housings and, there was, and, and it was just everywhere. And we were the first generation to be reared on TV. Now, I know that might sound simplistic, but I, let me just remind you, I told you I was meeting with a few, about two or three boomers last night, and we were just kind of reminiscing on some of this stuff, and we got to thinking about it, and I thought, man, you know, we, I grew up with Leave it to Beaver. Now, I know you young people, you're going, oh, pastor, go home and pull it up on, on the internet. It's there. Leave it to Beaver was a family that had, Ward was the dad, and June was the wife, and Wally was the older brother, and Beaver was the younger brother, and he had this uh, kind of a, a rebel kind of friend called Eddie Haskell, and, and, uh, and you, remember, you remember the Leave it to Beaver kind of life, right? I mean, every night they had dinner together, and when they had dinner together, Ward, the father, was always there. He had a tie and a jacket on. They all sat down together. They were peaceful. They were calm. They had a wonderful dinner together. When, he, when Ward would want to get a little bit loose, he would take off his jacket and his tie and put on a cardigan sweater. June was always there. She was dressed immaculately. Her, her makeup was wonderful. Her hair was always done. She, she wore a, a dress and a single strand of pearls, and she always had on high heels. 
And, and she just was wonderful, and they sat down to peace and quiet, and Wally never looked at, 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 at Beeve and said, tell Beeve to stop looking at me, and Beeve said, never, never said, tell Wally to stop touching me, and they never seemed to fight and argue. They always seemed to work together, and they seemed to work things out together. Ward never had an affair with Eddie Haskell's mom. June never popped Valiums and drank margaritas so that she could put up with the kids when they got home from school that afternoon. She was always perfectly dressed in decor. She was there every time those kids got home from school. She was there, and God bless their heart, they had fresh baked cookies every day. And I grew up with that as a role model, as, a, as an example of what life was like. And then there were the Nelsons, you know, Rick and Dave, right? And Rick was, uh, was a good singer, and he got a national recording contract right there on TV, I mean, my goodness, man. And then who could forget Andy Taylor and Mayberry? I mean, Andy, you remember Andy and, and Aunt B and Opie? You know, Aunt B was never a pain. She was always helpful. She had supper ready all the time. Andy never had trouble with women and dealing with lust and sex and so forth. There is a single dad raising up a little boy. He never seemed to have women trouble. Aunt B never got in his way, never made any fuss over anything. And he always had the answer to everything. No matter what was happening, he was so wise and brilliant, he could solve it in 27 minutes and have three minutes for commercials. No matter... No matter what problem presented itself, the problem was presented, the problem was solved, and, it, and everything, and, and they all lived happily ever after every episode. He even knew what to tell Opie when Opie was being harassed by the town bullies calling him Dopey Opie. <laughs> he had all the answers. Everything was great on TV. All the problems worked out. Everybody lived happily ever after. The families were great even when they were single parents. I mean, my goodness, no dad ever had boys greater than, 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 than Adam Hoss and Little Joe. I mean, Hoss might have had an eating disorder, but, that, I mean, but, but he was a good boy. And man, old Ben never ran into problems out there on the Ponderosa. He was a single dad. And he raised those boys, and they knew right from wrong, and they did right, and they were good. And no women ever came out there and stayed overnight in some kind of sexual liaison with old Ben, and he never seemed to be frustrated and agitated and annoyed by not having relationships like that. And I'm just, you, you, you see what I'm saying? I'm just saying that. We're so uptight because we overexpect because the things we've been fed aren't real. And they, right, they still aren't. I mean, you, right. McDonald's says, uh, what, have it your way. No, that's Burger King. McDonald's says, <laughs> McDonald's says you deserve a break today. Uh, Burger King says, have it your way. Nissan tells us we're driven. And Michelob says, uh, who says you can't have it all? Reality does. Common sense does. But we still expect it. Even though we know it's not reality, we know it's not true, common sense says nobody lives like this. Your life can't be like this. Everything's great on TV, but it doesn't work out like that in life. Eventually, life comes up and slaps you right between the eyes and the reality of life, you realize, uh, uh, I can't pay all the bills all the time. The house never stays as clean as I get it. Uh, the kids are, are trouble or mess. Somebody's got bad grades. Somebody's flunking out. Somebody's having trouble. Somebody's on drugs. Somebody, I mean, we just, the realities of life just get in and mess up everything. And yet, in our hearts, deep inside of us, just like Israel here, just like Israel, we still think we can have it all. So what happens when you want to have it all and you can't have it all? You get frustrated. So if you can't have it all, what do you need to have? There are three things. Let me get them. I got them right there for you. I'm thinking, you know, here's the first thing. Number one, you must have a sensible concept about life. God said, 
I want to give you the greatest land that you have ever had. I want to give you a land that is so wonderful you won't even believe it. And they looked right straight at God. And they said, no, God, we're not going to take your land. We want to do things on our own. We want to, we want to do things the way we want to do it. And, and, and here's an elementary principle. When you make choices, you have to live with the consequences of those choices. Now, now, can we all agree that this is not a complicated principle? Can we all agree this is a very elementary thing? That if you make a choice, God gives you the right to make a choice. But you do not have the opportunity to choose the consequences that follow that choice. If that is such an element, why, why do we have such trouble grasping it? Dad, you cannot walk away from your family and, it, and then choose as the consequences of that to have a great bunch of kids that aren't affected by the fact that they only get to see you every other weekend. And mom, you're sensible enough to know that if your family spits up, the kids are not going to be all right. consequences of choices that we make. If you spend all of the money that you make, you're going to go belly up. You cannot live spending more money than you're bringing in. The consequences, you have the right to make a choice, but, but you, don't, you, know, you, you can't choose the consequences that follow the choice. And this is very tough for us because we're a generation of over-expectors. We expect to have a great family like, like, like Ward and June Cleaver, man. We, we, we expect to have a, a, a nice home and great children like Timmy on Lassie or Opie Taylor or, you know, one, 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 one of those guys. We expect great relationships like, like Ward and June and Ozzie and Harriet and, you know, uh, uh, these great shows that we watch. And there's a giant gulf between what we expect and reality. I'm saying to you, if you can't have it all, which you can't, look at your neighbor and say, you can't have it all. I don't care what you expect, you can't have it all. And if you can't have it all, you're going to have to develop a sensible concept about life. What does a sensible concept about life? It just simply is face life with reality. The realities of choices and expectations. Because here's what happens. When, when we become, now, now this might sound a little psychological, and I don't really even mean for it to, because I'm really not a psychologist at all. But, but I, I, you know, I am getting a little older. Uh, <clears throat> I am middle-aged. Uh, I know you guys are. Well, I, I tell you, I'm going to live to be 120 and die in good health, right? Well, I'm, I'm almost 63, so that means I'm right at middle life, right? right. I mean, I'm just right at, uh, I'm, I'm just primed for a midlife crisis, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, what you know what midlife crisis is, I think? I think midlife crisis is when our expectations don't match the reality of our life. Because over-expectation really is a vicious cycle, and what it'll do is over-expectation, when it slaps you in the face and you realize, I can't have this, it turns into under-expectation. Let me show you what I mean. I, when I was young, and by young, I mean, you know, 20 years old, 25 years old, something like that, uh, I felt pretty much like by the time I got 50 years old, my life would be uh, set. You know, I mean, I, I had a career, I had an education, I had a wonderful wife, we had, we had begun our family, um, I was a mover and shaker. I was going up, up, and I was doing great, and everything was going to be fine. And, and if you had asked me at that point in my life, I would have said, man, by the time I get to be 50 years old, I'm going to have life by the tail on a downhill pool. I mean, I'm going to have, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be set. I'm going to have my, my future set. I'm going to have my retirement set. I'm going to have my life set, and I'm going to you know, be able to relax a little bit and enjoy life. Boy, was I wrong. Life didn't turn out anything like I expected. And so what happens when life doesn't turn out like you expect, sometimes you just flip 
right over diametrically. You said, if I can't have it all, man, bless God, I don't want to have anything. And so instead of, instead of continuing to work and challenging and, 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 and being grateful and thankful and hardworking, and all, I, I, I come to the attitude, no, do you used to do that. I've done all that. It doesn't do any good. I can't do it. I don't care how much I do. Those kids are still going to drive me crazy. I don't care we spend money. I can't make enough money. I mean, your over-expectation turns into basic underachievement and under-expectation. And instead of trying to clean up the house, mom, you just basically say, Psh, those kids, they just mess it up again anyway. I ain't no use to do that. Man, if they want a hot meal, let them set the cornflakes on fire. I'm dead. <laughs> I've had enough of that, and all you want to do, and all you want to do is sit on the couch with a channel changer in your hand. What I'm saying is, if you can't have it all, and you know, and you're not going to be uptight in this crazy world we live in, you must develop a sensible concept about life. And the sensible concept about life is that the reality of life is not the way we expect it to be. And when we make choices, those choices have consequences. And we are going to have to live with the consequences of our choices no matter what we expected when we started. Very simple, very, very elementary. A sensible concept about life. Here's the second thing. I must develop a sense of, con of contentment. And I've got those three things written under there. And there are blanks in your notes. I must develop a sense of contentment. You know, because no matter how much you have, if you're not content, it doesn't matter how much you have. Right? I mean, I could have everything in the world, and if there was no contentment inside of me, I would still be driven. I would still be anxious. I would still be running like a chicken with my head cut off, trying to get more, get more, get more. You know, nowadays, the theme of life nowadays is uh, we want the best. We want the best. We want the best house, the best car, the, the best family, the best uh, uh, property. We got to have all these gadgets and gizmos and trinkets. And, you know, we got to have everything that slices and dices and mixes and juices. And, uh, I mean, we got to have it all, man. Just so discontent. As if somehow getting some more stuff could make us happy and content in life. And the world just pushes us toward that all the time. There's an entire industry in this country that is created to make you discontent. It is called the advertising industry. The advertising industry's job is they wake up every day saying, how can I make them dissatisfied with their life? How can I make them dissatisfied with the things they have so I can introduce some new things that they will buy and I can make some money off of them? So they wake up every day trying to think up ways, okay, how can I make them discontent? If you can't have it all, you've got to have a sensible concept about life and you've got to develop a sense of contentment. You can always spend more than you make. I don't care how much you make. So at, here are the three things that, about contentment, and, and these are the three things that you've got to understand in order to be content. Number one, activity does not equal accomplishment. The busier I am doesn't mean the more I accomplish. Having a busy schedule and a hectic life doesn't mean you're successful. As a matter of fact, it's just the opposite of that, really. You've heard the old phrase that goes on the refrigerator, the hurrieder I get, the behinder I am, you know, something like that. Yeah. And so there are many people that believe that, man, if I can just keep my life going, fill my appointment schedule, uh, keep myself busy, keep going, do this, work in that club, be that down at the school, do this with the PTA, get on the golf committee, you know, get into a country club crowd, uh, get at church, do, I mean, and life just is helter-skelter, moving everywhere, activity, just filled with activity somehow. Uh, I can be content because I'm doing everything I can do and I'm successful in life. Fight that feeling. That is not true. Activity does not equal accomplishment. Second thing, accumulation does not equal accomplishment. If accumulation meant you were accomplished, then people with yard sales would be the happiest people on the face of the earth. Right? Because they have garages filled with junk they can't sell, and they got $60,000, $70,000 cars sitting outside in the, in the weather, right? Because there's so much stuff. 
we've accumulated so much stuff. We got to have it all. We got the gizmos and gadgets. So realize, in order to develop a sense of contentment, here's what it takes. Realize my life doesn't have to be so busy in order to be successful. I don't have to be going every moment of the day, every time I turn around, in order to be content. Sometimes I need to go sit on the back porch. You built the thing to sit on. And it, yeah, and it's, and it's the best, am I right? You've got the best porch swing, the best pillows. You've got the best chain. You've got the best uh, uh, roof on the thing. It doesn't leak. You can get out there. You've got ceiling fans that'll blow when it's, when it's too hot and you can have air blowing on you. And, you know, you got the fire pit out there and you can burn a little fire in the winter when it's cold. I mean, you built the thing to be enjoyable, but, but you're never there to enjoy it. And if you are, you feel guilty when you go out there and sit down for a minute because you feel like you ought to be doing something. That's the same problem Israel had in this passage right here. We can make all kinds of wrong choices and somehow the consequences are still going to be wonderful because we're God's fair-haired boys. God loves us better than anybody else and it doesn't matter what I do, God's still going to bless me. How foolish. That's not a sensible concept about life. Uh Uh-uh. And it's not a sense of contentment if you feel like you got to kill yourself in order to enjoy life and then accumulate a bunch of stuff. And then what I want you to see, the last one, what does equal accomplishment? Attitude. Your attitude equals accomplishment. You say, what? I say, listen to Jesus. What did Jesus say? Matthew 5, Beatitudes. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are those who are persecuted for my sake. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. I mean, the Beatitudes are filled with contradictory looking statements like be happy. That's what the word blessed means. Be happy when I'm sad. Be happy when I'm persecuted. Be happy when I'm tormented. Be happy when I'm poor. Be happy when... Yes! Contentment comes from an attitude of your life. Contentment does not come from stuff. It doesn't come from activity. It comes from your heart, from the inside out. Have you ever seen somebody that didn't have anything and all of a sudden they got a few resources and they built them a new place and, they, and it was beautiful and wonderful and it had all of the elaborate things and it was brand new and it was sparkling and it was shiny and it was clean and it was nice and everything else. And then about six months later, it looked like a pack of pigs moved in there and, and it, looked, it was nasty and cluttered and just, uh, it looked like it, 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 it a run down place. What happened? What happened is you can't be changed from the outside in. New house ain't going to do it for you. New car not going to do it for you. If you don't change the inside, that new stuff will be the same as your old stuff in just a short time. It's the, you got to change the inside. It's from the inside that you get changed. And so I must develop a sense of contentment. Let me give you one last little thing. You guys all right? Okay. I'm I'm not slamming you too bad, right? Okay. Well, maybe I need to try harder. All right. (laughs) Number three. (laughs) Number three. You must develop a sensitivity to the things that really count. All right, I got to have a sensible concept about life. I got to develop a sense of contentment. And then I've got to get, I, I, got to, I got to ask the Lord to give me a sensitivity to things that are really important. Like, let me ask you this question. Um, what is it that really counts in your life? Or let, me, or let me put it this way. 150 years from now, what is it that's going to still be with you? Your faith. 150 years, your stuff's not going to be with you. Because I'm going to let y'all know something. I've been pastoring for 43 years. I've done hundreds of funerals. I have never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. 
And I've never seen a, a casket with pockets all over it. You know why? Because you can't take it with you. 150 years from now, the only thing that's going to be with you is your faith and where it takes you. I don't care if you have billions of dollars like Howard Hughes. Somebody asked, how much did Howard Hughes leave? And the answer is, he left it all. Or if you drive Rolls Royces like J. Paul Getty. Or you have a big mansion like Elvis Presley. Or you have multi-million dollar outfits like Liberace. Or you have a circus at your house like Michael Jackson. Or you have recording studio, studios called Purple Rain, you know. I mean, like Prince. You know where all that? They're gone, and all that stuff is still left. When it's all said and done, all that really counts is your faith. I am convinced that the reason God puts us here on this earth, the reason God allows us to be born onto this earth is to give us an opportunity to decide where we're going to spend eternity. I don't care if you live 25 years, 50 years, 100 years, 150 years. That is an opportunity for you to decide where I'm going to spend eternity. Because no matter how long you may live, it's just a whisper of time in connection with eternity. And God says, I want you to make a choice. And the consequences of your choice are going to determine your destiny. You see, our crazy world teaches us that chance determines destiny. What star are you born under? What's your sign? What's your fortune? What kind of genetics? You this world says that that it's, that, it, that, that, that it's chance, that it's luck that determines our destiny. God says it's a choice that determines your destiny. Just like a choice I'll be asking you to make in a second. What am I going to do with Christ? That's the choice. And, and the consequences of that choice are either good for you or bad for you. Because the only thing that really lasts is faith and what faith will do. Narcissists, have you ever heard of, you've heard the term narcissism or somebody's narcissistic? You know where that comes from? You know what, why, that, why that is, what, what, that, what that, that term is? There's a Greek mythology figure called Narcissus. It's a man named Narcissus. And Narcissus was going along one day and he came to a puddle of water and when he looked over into the puddle of water he saw a reflection of himself. And when he saw the reflection of himself he was so beautiful that he fell in love with himself. And he, and he stayed so in love with himself that he could never love anyone else because no one ever compared to the beauty of himself. That's narcissism. That's thinking only of yourself. God says, look, don't live life like that. Life is bigger than you. Life is greater than you. And choice, you have choices to make. You can't have it all, but you can have what God says you can have, and that is a relationship with him. So whatever it is that, is, that interferes with your fellowship with Christ, pride, money, uh, uh, rebellion, uh, what, uh, disobedience, whatever it might be, what, inter what interferes with your relationship with Christ has to be put out of our life and we make a choice because those things are going to lead us to disrupt. We, we, we read, about, we read about, uh, about Israel and everybody said, man, they're going to get it. Oh, I can see the handwriting on the wall. It's going to be terrible. Yep, that's right. Because they, they disobey God. What kind of idiots are they to think that God's not going to, you know, it's not going to be some punishment to go with that. It's not going to be, God's not going to bless them like he said because they didn't obey. They made a bad choice. And then we make bad choices and we expect great outcomes. No, 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 no. You get a chance to make the choice, but you don't choose the consequence. I'm just saying choose wisely. Look at your neighbor and say choose wisely. All right.